long story short, from Whoa. that guy who is like getting so shady and like threatening to keep us in the country to then moving to uh, Enrique's setup where like we actually started doing some some first batches and uh, it was a, it was a Saturday, so most of the staff were already gone, and it was just me and Arno, my my co-founder, messing around with like the machines and just kind of you know figuring things out, doing a regular batch like how we were doing. And uh, I accidentally turned on the hydroelectric power instead of the power grid, which ended up like slow roasting the tea. Mm. And we thought we like screwed up this whole batch. We're like, wow, it's not drying. And, like it's been three hours, it's not dry yet. And like, we just destroyed this huge batch of leaves and like, oh, this really sucks. Cause we spent like all week preparing for this. And then we're like, okay, whatever. Let's just let it run and see where it goes, who knows. And then we kind of like leave and come back. And we're like, whoa, it smells like roasted cranberries in here. Like, what is that? And then uh, a couple other staff that were like cleaning up, they're like, dude, like it smells like desserts. Like what's yeah, going on? Yeah. We go to the machine, we like pull it out and we're like, holy shit, this smells so good. And so we, by accident, we ended up kind of slow drying this, this batch of tea that ended up tasting like unbelievable. And it was by far the best batch we ever made. And so at that point from then on, we then used that formula wow. to create all of our other uh, batches of tea, like the base tea for all of our products, including the dry tea. Wow. So it was kind of an accidental innovation, but it all happened because we ended up going to Enrique's farm. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to Think Space. How you guys doing? First and foremost, I'd like to introduce to you, uh, Wise Coffee Leaf. Wise Coffee Leaf. Now, who I'd actually like to introduce to you is Max Reve. Uh, innovator in the coffee industry, the tea industry. Here's a story for you. Here's the, here's the brass tacks. Here's what you really need to know. Um, Max went out, realized that the coffee bean industry is kind of fucked. They only make a very small amount of money and only for a short amount for a, a very small time frame in, within the year. They have a waste, which is the coffee leaves. Max has gone, taken that coffee leaf and made a phenomenal tea and iced tea. Um, one gram of sugar, um, very little caffeine, and it's incredible. So Max took, he's an entrepreneur, international business degree, all of that, very legit here in Vancouver, took the idea of number one, there's uh, all there's a, a coffee bean trade that's not so ethical and not working very well. How do we improve that? The Our society is in a caffeine overload crisis. Our society is also um, not hydrating the way that we need to hydrate. Our society is also loaded and just constantly consuming sugar. So how do we solve those problems? Um, what is it about entrepreneurship that can solve those problems? How can I introduce a product to the marketplace? Um, and how can I really change a narrative on caffeine consumption, sugar consumption? Um, and the guy is like a vegan keto. It's like crazy. I don't even know how that works. Um, but we talked about that and a whole lot more. We talked about a lot of, uh, stories he had from getting this company off the ground and to be as being as award-winning and successful as it is today and uh, it was just awesome to kick it with him and and really understand the narrative of his company uh and some overlying societal narratives and how everything's kind of played out so without further ado here's max reve Uh, you, your co-founder, we got coffee leaves, we got iced tea, we got an over-caffeinated society, we have an over, uh, a drug-addicted, sugar-addicted society, and all of a sudden you pop up and we got a coffee leaf uh, with two French, two French chaps doing their thing. What's the story, man? How'd you meet your co-founder? I uh, met him when we were going to school in France. Um, I'm from Vancouver and uh, wanted to do a master's and, and just upgrade my education. And I had a French passport and figured why not go travel and do Send something it. interesting. Yeah, no, don't, 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 saved don't. up my money from from working at a job that I hated. What and, was the job? Uh, uh, I won't say where it worked, but it was a finance. No company. names, no names, no names. Yeah, it was a finance company. And um, being the only marketer designer kind of like refresh all the branding. Yeah. It was a challenge when everyone's like a financial salesperson and they're just looking for like 24 hour ROI and you're like trying to build a brand a with brand. like longevity and, and real like loyalty, things like that. But it was just like, I realized later, you know, I was like kind of a kid. I just came out of university and had all these How like old are you? How old are you? dreams. I was 22 to 24 working Oof, there. Craziness. Yeah. And it was like the, it was like just when social started like kind of blowing up and yeah. I was trying to apply a lot of those, what would be like a consumer style marketing to, you know, B2B finance where it's like very low tech, especially in the sector that we're going after, like, you know, trucking or farming equipment, things like that. Like it was just not, 
not where you'd have like fancy Instagram campaigns. You know got what it, I mean? Got it, got but, it, got yeah, it. But yeah, anyways, I, I learned the hard way that sometimes, you know, the right marketing strategy isn't the right one if it's the wrong context. And then you're out here now running fancy marketing campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, we're, now I'm in a space where I always wanted to be. And that, that's why I left that job and I wanted right. to go to school and do something different because I never felt right there. Was that kind of like the the obvious route out of, out of school? Because you went, uh, was it was it international business? What was it? Yeah, international business. Uh, my undergrad was in um, was in tourism. My bachelor of tourism marketing, yeah. uh, tourism management in Kamloops, with a major in international uh, development <sighs> and also adventure tourism. So, my, in my background, okay. it was all like sustainable tourism development, basically. Right. And um, and after going into a finance company, just because it was like you know salary and benefits and i took another job that i hated like mm. it was just like just so underpaid so that i eventually fell back on that finance one and after two years just kind of regretting it yeah, yeah <laughs> being yeah. like oh my god i just can't wait to get out of here yeah um yeah i just just couldn't do it anymore so i wanted to go into international business to just upgrade my education but then also you know find a way to apply my own values to my career and not just like like it would just open more do doors basically you know Got it. and not get stuck in like the working for an agency at 35k and working you know 80 hour weeks like that, the agency that was life, on, man that was on the table multiple times and i was looking for jobs in vancouver and yeah. i was like dude i'm not gonna sign up for this because this is like what a 10-year commitment yeah. if i really want to do that job like i can't just go in and explode in two years it doesn't it doesn't work it doesn't work like that and it's so no. what is with that why is the agency culture so much like that where it's just like hey you're in the door here's 35k and i'm gonna need you from 6 a.m to 8 p.m every day seven days a week and I, there's I, no benefits i don't know i'm not i don't have enough experience in that space to really comment but i know a lot of friends who who do and it's just the the model you know a lot of people just say the model's broken but the model anyways, is kind of broken it is yeah. yeah it is what it is it is what it is now what about your model what about like what is your model now so you went in you went and you did the international business you went to finance okay cool you kind of were like all right this is not where my heart is the digital thing mm, maybe not too and then all of a sudden you stumble upon this you seem to have a business model that works damn well far better than the agency model that's for sure a completely different business and and, and all but uh what what was the initial uh thought pattern or the initial I don't know like ethos genesis yeah genesis of of what you got here now um yeah so essentially like i grew up being an athlete my whole life um playing hockey you know elite hockey and doing snowboarding and everything else that you do in vancouver basically yep. um and uh i remember like there on a few occasions where like energy drinks were there available i'm like okay i'll try this and like see if it helps me in tryouts or whatever and it actually just like ruined ruined my game Horrible. in the end yeah so it Horrible. just like was a bad idea and i realized that when i was like 15 and then uh you know when i entered the work world it was all coffee this coffee that you know if you want to hustle 12 hours a day you got to drink more coffee and like you know it's everyone it's the, the one thing i can't stand about it is like everyone glorifies how much coffee they drink mm. it's like wow like congratulations you're a slave to coffee mm -hmm. like cool bro yeah. you know sick shit. <laughs> and it's like i think people are realizing that they don't need as much coffee so and i fell in that same pattern so um when i after doing two years of that finance company just i was like drinking five coffees a day and i just hated it been there um been there and and even before then i took this this kind of short-term tourism job right out of school and i was doing a basically like tour bus driving uh going from vancouver up to jasper and back like seven day tour through the rockies but i was also kind of like a city guide as well and i was a booking agent like it was a crazy job it was a lot of fun a lot of good experience but i got on my on my like maybe seventh or eighth tour and on my first day in the first morning like before 10 a.m um i'm on my second coffee and i'm like starting to fall asleep at the wheel Hectic. <laughs> and i was like this is this is just a literally recipe for disaster i got 22 international travelers on my bus yeah and like you know if i seriously do like one small misstep like i'm like we're all done and and, and whoever else i i might injure on the road so that was a huge realization of like okay like i need to seriously rejig like this idea that coffee can solve the problem mm. um and also just recalibrate how I live my life, like the day-to-day, -day, you know, routines and how to stay properly hydrated and not hydrated where you just drink water, like hydration with electrolytes, et cetera, like things like that, where you realize like, oh, these little small things make a humongous difference. So yeah, all that, all these little small episodes with caffeine over time, like, you know, they built up and then it came to this culminating point where I was in France doing a master's after quitting that finance job. And, uh, it was, finals uh for like the set the first 
um, semester, basically, like just before Christmas time. And I got handed this this agency contract to design, and it was like super last minute deadline thing. And I'm like, okay, like I need, we need you to just crush this out. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll help you guys out. And so I end up going, I end up working till like four a.m. and then going to bed, waking up at seven a.m. to go back to school and drinking like five or six coffees a day. Like I do like a tall drip, like this big. When I get to school, I'd have maybe half of it, like half it down already. That add an espresso shot to it, just to give a bit more bump. Oh, and then I would have like another coffee or two during the day, and then I have another coffee at night when I get home, and then I have like another espresso in the evening, just to like work again till like three or four in the morning. Fuck. And I did that for about ten days, and uh, eventually I was sitting in class on a Thursday at like eleven thirty in the morning, and I was just like, I was just like shaking like crazy, and I felt like out of body in a sense, like in a bad way. And I was like, there's something so weird going on. I was like, I don't have the flu. Like, I don't have any of those symptoms or whatever. But like, I just feel like really twisted right now. And so I go home and like, basically everything comes out of my body. Um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to put it lightly. To put it lightly. Got it. And, and then I was like, okay, this is like so wrong right now. And so then I go to the doctor and he's like, dude, like you overdose on caffeine. Like, it's clear. It's obvious. And I was like, wow. Okay. And like for the following two weeks, I was playing... Uh, I was playing national um, roller hockey in France what? and I was trying to play and I was just I was playing defense and I was just so tired because like nothing I ate would digest because mm. I was just my whole gut was completely screwed from coffee Crazy. like I couldn't digest anything it was it was like basically like I put food in and it's like doesn't absorb and that's it had no energy at all and uh, and so yeah I'd go to the doctors you got to get off coffee and i was like oh this sucks and uh because like, no. i love i grew up drinking coffee in like a french household you know we're not we weren't huge tea drinkers at home necessarily and most of my exposure to tea in general like traditional tea green black tea etc was when i go to all the awesome asian restaurants in vancouver got it and i never really loved like the bitter the bitter aspect or like the grassiness aspect right. especially I like a black tea or a green tea yeah and if you over if you oversteep it even by like 30 seconds it just gets it really ruins. gnarly yeah, yeah. and I, I hated the fact that you always have to add milk or sugar just to make it like really drinkable right you know and so i was like i don't know tea's not really my thing but i'll start looking around and then uh you know christmas vacation passes and by the time we get back to our our school in the first uh first week of the second semester in january we have a new uh global entrepreneurship project and it's a six month long course. That's basically the second half of our masters where you you pitch for like an like a fake investment at the end of the year. Lo sure. Lots of master's courses have the same kind of structure. Right. And so we had a group of Hold on, um, what's a fake investment? Oh, uh, it's just like <laughs> it's like a, you know, like a like a faux uh award. You know what I mean? Okay, it's cool. like, oh, you won the thing, but it's like you don't really get any real money. You don't win. Shit. Yeah, but yeah. but you have like, you know, industry pundits and like and professional some exposure. Yeah, like you get, you know, people from Paris are coming down because we were in South of France. They come down and do like their thing and judge you and all this stuff. It was fairly official considering it was, it was a pretty a reputable, uh, reputable school in France. And so anyways, first day looking at some ideas and I go through this like newsletter that uh, that my one of my mentors told me to follow. And I still thank him to this day, uh, Lance Saunders, who used to be at DDB. And um, and he's like, you got to follow this this website because they always have amazing content, whether it's marketing or medical or whatever. And I see this this uh, study about the coffee leaf mm -hmm. and how it has more antioxidants than the green tea leaf, or rather the tea leaf, like Camilla sinensis is like the tea plant where okay. like traditional tea is from, yeah. green, black, et cetera. They're all from the same plant. What's the, what's the plant called again? Camilla sinensis. Okay. I'm probably butchering it. Camellia sinensis. Yeah, anyways. That is cool. It sounded legit. It's, it's kind of the same. You shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was so, on. I was on board. So it's all from the tea plant. And 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 the coffee leaf show that it had more antioxidants in the coffee leaf versus the tea leaf. And it also has more antioxidants than like roasted coffee beans. And so we're like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. I never thought of the leaf would have anything specific, right? You never waste. hear about the leaf. Yeah. And, um, and then you start reading more and it's like, you know, it's been consumed in Ethiopia for over 300 years. Some reports going as far back as 1300 years. And you're just like, okay, wow, like that's it's got some history. Mm. And then, you know, the the Dutch, when they brought coffee from Ethiopia to Indonesia, the Indonesian locals preferred to drink the leaf tea over the coffee beans because they said it was more nutritious uh. and it was like easier and just more abundant. And so they would just prefer to consume that instead. And like we were reading these things and and as we peel back more and more layers of this whole thing we're like wait a second there's all these journal entries from like the 1800s and like the late 1700s talking about it 
and and like how a guy, for example, in uh, at the London Great Expo in like the 1850s tried to present this and pitch this product, and it just never took off. The London Great Expo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Like, okay, cool. I know in the mid 1800s, and so you're like, okay, wait a sec. Like people have been trying to do this for a while, and there's like rumblings in these super old like buried journals that you know you'll never find unless right. you start digging. And uh, we're like, this is really interesting. And so then we start looking at the coffee industry, and the immediate you know, uh, number one priority or number one challenge, I should say, with the industry was that it's so seasonal and also the pricing is so volatile from the world market price mm. uh, perspective that they're only harvesting the bean for three months. And in those three months, they might get a price that is under, in, in most cases, they get a price that's under the cost to produce. So they're losing money. So right now, for example, like in, in the span of like every decade, there's only about two or three years where a coffee coffee uh, farmer will guaranteed make money. Mm. Those other, you know, six, seven, eight years, they're literally selling at a loss. And another, so a good example is right now, like the, the price for a, a pound of coffee, um, you know, as of maybe three weeks ago, I'm, I'm a little bit outdated now, was just under a dollar again. Wow. And it costs about $1.40 to produce. And in Costa Rica, for example, or like, you know, higher certification or whatever, it costs about $1.80. Right. And so it's like, why would you be in the business if you know you're going to lose, right? Why is the demand so low or the, the price so low? It's it's because there's always a huge influx of of production, whether it comes from Brazil or, in, or uh, Vietnam or Indonesia, et cetera. Like it, it varies quite a bit. But every time there's like an oversupply, it just completely crumb, uh, crumbles the the cost, and so or the pricing. The challenge is that the cost of a cup of coffee at retail hasn't really budged that much in the last 20, 30 years. Okay. Whereas the cost to produce has just gone higher and higher and higher. And now with climate change, the yield is also less predictable because you have like crazy long droughts out of nowhere. Yeah, and weather yield, patterns that are wild. Yeah, your yield gets decimated that winter, mm. and so you can't really predict as much. So when you have less prediction or less predictability on the crops, when you have a short season, when you have extremely volatile pricing, and all of a sudden all the farmers are starting, they're like trying to abandon their crops now because it's not, it doesn't make sense. It's not profitable. None of these farmers can get credit either. So they can't finance anything to like, you know, have that bridge loan or like, or like, you know, like bridge those Whatever. gaps yeah. in, in the cash flow cycle, right? Yeah. So they all struggle and most of them go under and then they end up having to owe a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, certification companies or they end up owing different co-ops and whatnot. And, and then there's some really gnarly things that happen in terms of, you know, when a farmer owes someone something I'm sure. in those regions, because there's a lot, not a lot of uh, legal literacy at the farmer level, right? So they get taken advantage of in some cases. So we started noticing this on a high level and being like, hold like, wait a second here. This is all going on right now. And, and the leaf actually gets um, uh, pruned off the plant for maintenance in the off season. Right. So they're calling like, you know, five, 10% of the plant on a cycle every single summer just to kind of maintain the aeration of the plant, make sure it's not too like thick or bushy or whatever. And these, these leaves are just getting tossed. And so we're just like, okay, hold on. Like, first of all, no one has ever gone in and experimented with the leaf beyond these dudes in the 1800s. Like realistically, it's never really happened. Second of all, they're struggling to make ends meet for three quarters of the year when only 15 to 20% of the employment sticks around. The rest of that, all those folks, they try to migrate and they have to bring their kids with them and they have to get their kids out of school and go to a different city or whatever. It's it's super hectic and it's very it's very difficult to have like a stable family. And then, you know, we start realizing, okay, like if there's something we can do with this leaf, all of a sudden it'll solve the the seasonality issue. They won't be as dependent on the pricing issue with the coffee bean being so volatile all the time. Because they're going to offset it. Yeah. And the, the, and the predictability of the leaves is like way higher than the bean because the bean takes a lot of resources. Mm. It takes a ton of energy and and from like a scientific perspective, a lot of energy for the plant and a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, etc. Whereas the leaf is just kind of regenerates pretty much on its own. It's it's basically autopilot and it'll always be there. Mm. Sounds like um, weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bud's super tough, but like, a, like the the leaves are coming regardless. It's like any other. It's like any other fruiting plant because yeah. the the fruit is always like the biggest thing. You know, it's the biggest commitment for the plant, and it yeah. puts all of its resources into that. And if it doesn't have enough resources, it'll just not fruit. But the, but the leaves doing photosynthesis are always going to be there because it ha That's just how it lives. It's in fundamental breeds. to the plant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. We started realizing this, like, okay, this is kind of crazy. Um, and as we just did more research and we started talking to the researcher who led the study about the health components, they did this study over seven years and studied um, coffee leaves from like five different countries, like around the world and super like legit study out of London and collaboration with a French university. Whoa. Um, yeah, like legit. And um, 
we're like, okay, at the end of the year, we're like, we have a cool concept for this. It's lightly caffeinated. So you're still this in is school. still in school. Shit. Doing all of our research for our thesis project. Wow. Like the the master's like global entrepreneurship project. And so we're like, okay, this sounds like a cool idea. All theory, right? All theory. Um, at the end of the school year, we're like, well, this is late. This is mid-2013. European economy is absolutely crushing itself. Like it's just in the tank. Spain's the worst. Italy is yeah. just going down. And my Greece plan, is shit. My plan to go out there, my plan to go out there in France was like, maybe I'll get set up for like four or five years, do a career in like a multinational there and like go up the ranks quick because I have like fluent English, I'm fluent French and Spanish yeah. and like whatever, like maybe I can excel faster in Europe and then bring that back to Vancouver and have like a better job, you know, right out of the gate when I land here. Right. Uh, but in the end, it's like, oh, wait a sec, you go there and like half of Spain is unemployed, <laughs> you know, and half of the people in France under 25 are unemployed. Right. And it's like all that is is like these internships for like McKinsey and Deloitte and all those major companies that you're like spending hours and hours doing applications for. And every single time I was doing an application, I was just like, I'm wasting time I could spend on this coffee leaf project. Yeah. I really feel like there's something here. Yeah. And me coming off of a high high caffeine addiction and, and overdosing on it, I was like, this is lightly caffeinated. Like it would work for me, you know, as long as it tastes good. I have no idea what it tastes like. Right. So that was, that was like the big, the big gamble, so to speak. Um, so and we heard like different reports and different things like oh like some of it's some of pe some people say it's really good some people say it's really grassy but like these are like super oh, nebulous okay. reports that like okay like we don't have any real reference like a modern reference for this so um at the end of the year you know we had really had nothing else going on in europe and my my co-founder and i were like well dude like let's go do this Fuck like it. i was like i got a credit card like <laughs> let's go to nicaragua and yeah. just like find these dudes let's make a sample or find a dude let's say a farmer farmer make a sample we'll go surfing for like our last week of the month It'll be and sick. then we'll just bounce back to vancouver and launch this thing we thought it was that simple obviously right uh but in the end yeah we land in, in nicaragua we start like backpacking finding farmers um and we eventually find a guy and we trade our first bag of leaves for uh, a 12 year bottle of rum and uh and it was a fair trade because it's like we don't have no idea what the value of this is you know obviously like we right. want to make sure you know you have your incentive and whatever and he was a super nice guy um and then we <laughs> started hilarious. we started messing around with the first batch like learning everything we can from the tea world through like books youtube videos everything we could calling people whatever and we made our first batch with like extremely limited amount of skill or knowledge and when we when it came to tasting time we have dun, like dun, we dun. have like the, the tasting spoon and we're like spooning it up and I, my hands just like shaking. I'm like, dude, <laughs> it actually took us three months to get to this point, not a month. It, it was way undershot. It took yeah. way longer than we thought. And I was like, if this tastes like crap, like, like, fuck, <laughs> we just wasted so much time and money on this. And yeah. I, God, I just hope it works. And I taste it. We taste it. And we're like, holy shit, it's actually so smooth. Like this is crazy. Like it's actually Sick. really good. It tastes better than green tea. Like. Yeah. Wow, like leaps yeah. and leaps and bounds. And we still don't even know what we're doing yet. Yeah. You know, like it's like literally step one of a million. And we're just <laughs> like, okay, like this, this has legs. Like yeah. this is nuts. So, and so, yeah, what we, a moment. we packed up our stuff. We got our 17 kilogram batch with us and we threw it in luggage <laughs> and flew back to Vancouver and then took a whole year to do like paperwork and, and Health Canada approvals, et cetera. But yeah, and then we launched the following, uh, the following spring after that. What year was that? It was... We came back with a sample, uh, literally like it was Halloween day when we flew back in. <laughs> and so that night we like went out and partied. But yeah, it was Halloween, like literally 2013. And then we spent a year, actually a year and a bit uh, working on the on the paperwork. And I guess we launched, no, I guess we launched the Kickstarter uh, in the fall of 2014. Wow. Yeah. How yeah. much well, How much were you raising for Kickstarter? Oh, we, we had, we tried to raise way too much. We tried really? to raise like 40 grand and no one knew That's it. That's too much? Yeah. But when someone, when, when it's a taste product, like if it was like a little, uh, like a gadget or like a tech thing, people yeah. will, they'll pay for that no matter what, because they know that the benefit is this, you know, X, Y, Z. Whereas when it comes down to taste, like, no ah. one has any idea, right? And we had like way too many things built into the raise. Like we need like X, 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 X equipment. And it should have been just like, we need like two things. It's going to cost us 10 grand. Yeah. And then we would have just like crushed it. But because you're so close, because it's such a large goal, if you don't get like 50% in the first two or three days, you don't hit, you don't hit the algorithm and you get buried with all the other projects. Uh... And, by, and at that time we had a bunch of press. And so people were like, well, I just want to buy it. Like, just let me buy the product. So we said, screw it. After two or three weeks, we just cut the Kickstarter to open the web store and had like five grand sales first day. Wow. Yeah. And then so we just were like, screw this. Let's just sell the, the pre-orders for the full box and we'll sell all the samples. That way people can just pay 10 bucks a pop, get a few samples shipped worldwide. 
and uh and, and go that way jesus christ man what a story what a journey oh my god that doesn't even include like the gnarly like mugging and and all these other whoa gnarly sh- mugging shady bro stories. what I mean, oh, I, don't, I don't know if we want to jump in. All right, man. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's there's, there's so much that happens oh. over the course of a company. It's absolutely fucking crazy. And just like just for just for like a finished product. I think a lot of people don't understand what it takes to like, OK, yeah, great. Here's a, here's a can with some stuff in it. But that doesn't yeah. so far from reality. Right. And the, the funny thing is that like a lot of people are like, oh, well, coffee leaves like the, because the farmers are throwing it out. It just must be free. You just right. go get it for free. And it's like, ha, no, there's a ton of labor involved because you got to harvest it properly. You got to roll it, oxidize, ferment, dry. It's very, very much a craft process that we that we've innovated from literally from scratch. And, you know, and you got to train those people. And like and that's the whole point is like we're trying to employ people year round. If it was free, then like we're not we don't have that much of an impact, right? Like, right. so no matter what, you're going to have to create it somehow. And like, that's where they come in and they make their money and they do something really, new, really new and really special. Um, but yeah, like going to, you know, a developing country where we have, you know, by Canadian standards, good Spanish by, by Nicaraguan standards, nah. rusty, nah. <laughs> um, you know, figuring that out when they look at us being like two gringos and like yeah. mid twenties at the time, they're just like, why do you want the leaves? Like, yeah, what are you fucking idiots? Like, like get, get out of here, bud. Yeah, like, yeah. we've been doing the same thing for 300 years. Like, it's all good. We yeah. know what we're doing. And we're just like, oh, man, okay, this is going to be a hard sell for some of you guys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some of the stories are hilarious. Like, we spent a night, we we hopped in the back of a truck to go to our other town to, like, connect our farmer and our and our processing crew to, like, do, like, a, like a team dinner at, like, a nice, like, steakhouse. Sure. You know? And we hopped in the back of the truck and because we're like, oh, you're the young kids, just like go in the back, like in the in the box instead yeah. of like in the cabin. It's like, yo, we're like paying for everyone's wages and dinner. And you guys like chuck us in the back. Yeah, fuck you guys. We're like, yeah. okay, no big deal. Like, yeah. it's all good. We don't care. Like Nicaragua style, who gives a shit, right? And sure enough, on our drive there, it starts like pissing rain. And, and they're like, yeah, just like throw the tarp over you. And so we're under this like plastic tarp and we're just like holding it down, like flying on the highway <laughs> as we're like passing semi trucks in like a tropical downpour between these two uh kind of mountain (laughs) cities it was like so sketchy and we're sitting on top of boxes we're not in the box right and so we're like i'm like holding myself against the rail from like sliding literally off Off the truck off the truck yeah at 90k in the rain um (laughs) we eventually do the dinner and it was all good we we go party we go to like our favorite you know one of the two bars in town uh we meet these guys we end up smoking hookah like half the evening because it's like at the (laughs) it's at the bar there yeah um and they're like, yo, come back to our place. We'll have after party, like nightcap, whatever. We're like, yeah, sure. We go there. And then they start getting like, you can tell like the older brother, it's like five brothers and there's like no parents around. And some of the kids are like, like 13, you know, like yeah. it's like from a 28 year old down to like a 13 year old. Okay. And like the older brother is like the ringleader, you know? <laughs> and, and so we're like hanging out there and like having fun and whatever. And you can tell Buddy's like getting like really sketched out. Like he's just like looking for something all the time. And you're right. like, okay, like there's something's going, something's on, going here. on here. My my EQ, where my coffee leaves. Yeah, my <laughs> yeah my my sense starts starts going off. And uh, sure enough, he starts asking us for money, and yeah. he's asking us for money to go so he can go get drugs and everything. And he's like, "Do you guys want it?" I was like, "No, like, dude, it's four a.m. Like, I'm done. I'm good." And yeah. we're also like, kind of the last thing I would do in this place right now. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like. Yeah had a great time. Thank you. Like we're going to bounce whatever. Yeah. And as we we're trying to leave, like I'm trying to pull my co-founder Arno out and he's just like kind of more casual with the guy. And I was like, dude, we got to get out of here right now. It's you don't get it. Shady right now. Like we, yeah. if we don't leave. We're going to, we're going to pay for this. And so we try to leave. And then the guy starts like pushing my buddy around and I go in there and I was like, yo, like get the hell off of him. Just kind of shove him. And then we just start booking it down the hill. And like, we're at this point, we're at the edge of the town where it starts to turn into farmland. Yeah. And so you're kind of outside the city and it's not like, there's no one really around. So you're, if you look at it, if think of like, a, you know, when you see like Brazilian favelas, how it's like on the side of a hill and it's yeah. kind of like shanty houses, Got it's it. kind of like that. Okay. And so we're at the top of this hill and we're just like, start booking it down this brick road and we're just like running and running, running. We're like, hey, this is like sketchy as fuck right now. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also we hadn't, we'd have even booked a hotel that night because we so were not nowhere to stay we weren't planning on staying because we didn't want to take a ride back in that truck we're like let's just crash at our hostel we usually go to we don't even have luggage like yeah. let's just go there and like we'll just you don't even have the luggage you're just like in no and in? we forgot to book anything and so it's 4 a.m we saw nothing booked and we're, like, <laughs> we're running away from these guys what trying to like trying to mug us for for drug money and so anyways we're running down the street and we're like okay i think we got a good gap like it's all good i think we're we're good now and we walk by this like street light and it's like pitch black out except for this one street light and kind of past the street light 
start hearing these steps in the distance, like doo, 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 doo. like someone's running and it's getting closer. Yeah. I was like, oh shit, they're coming oh, after us. No. So I kind of tucked around the side of the streetlight in the dark. And as soon as this dude who was like hammered, who's like trying to like the ringleader, the guy who was like the most motivated, he starts like he starts coming down. And I just walk into him like a classic open ice hockey hit shoulder to the chest <laughs> and just stepped into him like this and just fucking decked this guy. <laughs> and I was like, hey, it was clean. I didn't punch you. I don't yeah. have a weapon. Yeah. And you're the one chasing us. I was like, shoulder to the chest. It's yeah. going to wind you a little bit, but you'll be fine. And he just decked onto his back. And then he got up and tried to like fight again. And I just put my knee up and my hand up. I was like, get the hell out of here. And then we started running again because we could hear his brothers coming. What the fuck? And so we're like, okay, <laughs> shit, like this is getting real. These guys are coming too. So we start booking it down. We find this like little sketchy little narrow staircase between like all these little favela houses. And it's just like just running down these staircases in the middle of the night. It, it was like the weirdest, weirdest moment ever. I felt like it was it was a low budget 007 movie, like in a, in a, in a fucked up way. And so we eventually just like make our way down to the bottom of the valley where we can at least recognize some some roads. And then we start booking it up the road to the hostel where we usually stay at. Right. And we're like knocking on the door at the gate and uh, we're calling uh, Nestor. Nestor is like the guy who just runs the hostel. We're like, Nestor, like, let open us. Open up. Let, us, get in, us, let us in, bro. It's for you. Like, <laughs> let us open the door. And he's like, what the hell are you guys doing here? We're like, we were planning on staying but these guys are chasing us and like you gotta let us in he's like oh shit okay and so he let us in that night and then we get in and we're like and then we just start laughing our heads off and being like oh what God. the hell just happened dude like a ridiculous you know from a from like a 4 p.m to a 4 a.m window like all this shit that went down was was absolutely hilarious um and so like all these little adventures you know it was all to make something new and different happen where most people you know, let's say in the beverage world, we're like, oh, I have a sparkling water with CBD or I have a sparkling water with like other, you know, mushroom you extracts it. and stuff. No. Like those are sick products and I drink them too. But a lot of people don't understand the challenge of going somewhere completely different, creating something that has never been done before yeah. in, in, in the natural world, uh, not in a, in a medical lab. And then, you know, training people how to do that on a, on a larger scale to create an award-winning tasting product. Like it's... You know, people ask like, oh, wow, you've been in the game seven years. And it's like, yeah, well, it's doesn't you can't launch something like this overnight. You know, we've been doing the, di the dry tea for a long time. And now now the iced tea is ready to go. So that's crazy, man. I'm super curious to know, like, <laughs> what your ecosystem is like from the farmers down there, where you're sourcing from. Like you said, like you just said, oh, I had to try to, you know, make up a little dinner between the, the processor yeah, yeah. and the farmer. I'm like, what? You know, like versus like, you know, people people try to source things from overseas, from down south or whatever. And then just like they hit a dis uh, distributor and, and and they're good to go type thing. And it's like, bam, yeah. versus like you're down there. OK, these people don't know each other. I need this to go to here and then it's going to come shit back up here. And I'm going to process it at this spot. And then we're going to add and then there's the sales and the marketing, the distribution. It's just yeah, like, dude, there's like so much like the supply what is chain your ecosystem. The supply chain was really the biggest challenge because we had to first create the product where it was tasty and then also learn how to scale that. Um, and do it with the right partners that were that had the right ethics as well. Right. Ooh. And um, add a dynamic. Oh my god. Yeah. So the first guy. This this is another funny story. So the first guy we we're working with was the only guy who we got. We I got bit by a dog. Like you can kind of see the scar there, but <laughs> okay. I got bit by a dog on our first weekend in Nicaragua when we first started. Okay. And then this guy comes up. He's like, "Oh, that's my cousin's dog." Uh, and he speaks English. So he comes up and just speaking English, and he's uh -huh. like. He's like, dude, I'm so sorry. Like, I'll give you cigars, whatever. No big deal. And I was like, it's all good. Like, it's, you know, dogs are dogs. I love dogs. You know, yeah, sometimes they bite. It's all good. And, uh, you know, a week later, we see him in a bar. And he's like, so what are you guys doing in town? Or like, oh, we have this coffee project. And we're looking for like a trustworthy farmer and things like that. And he's like, oh, you got to talk to my uncle. Um, no, who, so who, who I will leave unnamed. This is so sick. Yeah. And we meet him. And like, he's super dope, you know, at first. And he's like, he speaks English. He's a Nicaraguan British, uh, like a mixed citizen or dual citizen, I suppose. He actually spent, um, I don't know, four or five years in the US doing first recon for the Navy. <laughs> And did his schooling in Florida or something like that. Sure. At least that's what he and, said. And that's he what owns, he said. Yeah. And he owns a couple <laughs> of coffee farms and he's like, he manages a lot of like resources and, and buys like futures for coffee pricing, things like that. And so we're like, okay, this guy knows scalability. He, he knows, knows the game. He knows how to export. And we're like, okay, cool. And he speaks English, so it helps. And we're like, okay, this is great. He's a good partner. Let's just go with this because no one else has really shown this kind of uh, initiative. And we try to go with all the fair trade co ops. We try to go with all the other kind of, uh, you know, more ethical uh, situations. But in the end, they're they're high they're hyper complex, and um, a lot of them were a little bit shady, 
And so we were just like, you know what, like this is too complicated and we don't have any sort of security of supply or let alone consistency. Cause you got to train like 250 farmers that have one acre uh, to make a batch. And it's like, this is going to take forever. You have to train them too. Yeah. Like it just takes way too much Fuck. time, but it was mostly cause it was just, they were really poorly managed and like the farms were not done well. Um, and the workers were living in pretty bad conditions. So we were from a consumer perspective, like being like, let's go to the pinnacles of ethical sourcing, realizing that it was actually pretty like kind of shoddy mm -hmm. we were just like wow okay like this is just not what we expected we were pretty disappointed so we shifted gears like hey let's go with a private guy and this was the first guy who, who came to came to our uh, on our plate so he was cool at first and then we realized you know a year in or whatever he's basically not holding up his end of the bargain we go check out the farm where we're like he had a specific lot for us and like none of the plants were being cared for they were complete they were emaciated they were a total joke it was right. it was like this is a a gong show right you got it we had no help. It was like one, his farmhand who was working seven days a week, drinking obscene amounts of coffee, eventually had, um, uh, I can't remember if it was like a liver or like a kidney issue because of too much coffee. Mm. And like, this is also another thing that they have down there. They drink so much coffee because it's like easier to access than just fresh water. And so they would just drink coffee. <laughs> and um, Hectic. Okay. I know. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Whoa. And so we're like, okay, this is so gnarly. This guy's like being so bad as right. as a farmer. And we're trying hard to like make him money. You know, it's mm. kind of ridiculous. And eventually we get introduced to this guy, Enrique. And Enrique is a third generation farmer in, in the same town. And uh, he's got a thousand acres of coffee, a thousand acres of protected rainforest. And they're all kind of interspersed. And uh, and we met him through a an ethical coffee buyer. At the same time, we were talking to the Nicaraguan Development Export Agency to ask them to recommend to us who would be the best farmer or like the best partner to just figure this out with. And they also said, go to Enrique Ferrofino. And we're okay. like, oh, wow. Okay. okay. So like double validation from like an industry, but also from a, a political or like a government side of things. Um, and then we met him and saw the farm and was like, dude, this is like next level. Like you have full on built apartment complexes for the workers it's wow. not just like here's some scrap metal and some wood make a house kind of thing which yeah. is what most farms are like and uh and like there's a school there's there's spring water fountains everywhere from the spring that's naturally coming out of the mountain where they, where they have the farm yeah it's super sick they have hydroelectric power like all these things and we're just like this is like the google of coffee farms kind of thing got it uh google in the best sense of the word <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um and so he loved the idea because he's like, wait a second, like I can start crafting something different that no one else has really tried. And him being a, a very much a curious mind, like an innovator as well. Um, he was like, I am so down to just mess around with this. Yeah. And so we just did like this big harvest on one day. And uh, it just so happens, it just so happens the exact same moment when we bring like the harvest or like the, the, the prunings into the facility. One of the uh, fertilizer sales people that goes around all the farms and meets all the farmers he knew us from the other farm yeah. we we're working with the first guy and we we're still under contract with him no as soon as i get back on the road we get like half an hour later back in the town where you get reception my phone's like blowing up with these text messages being like oh yeah chavez told me that you guys are farming at, at ferrofino's place i'm gonna sue you for breach of contract i'm gonna contact my friends in the military and keep you in the country we're, no. we're supposed to fly out in like a week and he's like he's like making all these claims how he's he's going to go talk to the the like the judge the head judge in managua capital city to like make sure that our our Fuck. court case happens quick and doesn't let us out of the country i'm mean, just like and we're just obviously fucking panicking like we're just like this is insane and this we know this guy's got contacts and he keeps like telling us about how he's got like golden uzis and all this shit like we're trying to show off to us and all Crazy the guns he has we always knew this guy was weird but at this level we're like okay dude <sighs> And it was in our contract to say that we're, we can go look at other farms to scale beyond because eventually that's going to have to happen. Like it's, yeah. it just makes sense. But he took it as like a total breach of contract. And it's like, well, first of all, you already breached like three or four times ahead of this. And our contract was kind of like handwritten by us. It was not like a full legally proofed. Yeah, it wasn't fully legally approved. So it wouldn't really hold up in court anyways. But that being said, like I called my buddies who own this resort in Nicaragua. Uh, I was like, dude, I need a, I need a, a good lawyer now. Yeah. And he's like, okay, call these dudes, whatever. I call the guy. He calls me that night. And he's like, come to Managua tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And we'll have a meeting. And oh, so my God. I just jump in the rental car first thing at like 6 a.m. in the morning, book it to, <laughs> to Managua, have this meeting. And I'm having this meeting. And uh, and he's like, yeah, like, let's just see what we can do. Let's just reply with this, whatnot, whatever. At the same time, I'm getting a text message from my partner, my my life partner, thinking that I hooked up with someone when I was in Nicaragua. No. As I'm walking into the room and I was like, 
oh my god wait a sec what this never happened also why is this happening right now like how can more things just pile on top of each other oh in like my god. In, in one morning i'm just like literally shitting myself Fuck. i was like i'm home in like three or four days like can can this just wait wait <laughs> like you're hey, making no but wait you're making all these assumptions from like a facebook photo and i'm like freaking out because you're freaking out now yeah. and i'm just about to walk into a meeting with a lawyer about yeah. him trying to get us out of the country Intrigue. like this is just so complicated right now and so eventually after multiple letters back and forth he's we, we even offered him to pay out the contract for like the rest of the money it wasn't much like six grand and and he's like he's like no and i want damages like 20k whatever it's Shut like dude you just it. lost six grand by saying that like yeah. see you later and we just yeah. never replied thankfully like nothing ever happened but we eventually like long story short from <laughs> that guy who was like getting so shady and like threatening to keep us in the country to then moving to uh enrique's setup where like we actually started doing some some first batches and uh it was a it was a saturday so most of the staff were already gone and it was just me and arno my, my co-founder messing around with like the machines and just kind of you know figuring things out doing a regular batch like how we were doing and uh i accidentally turned on the hydroelectric power instead of the power grid which ended up like slow roasting the tea mm. and we thought we like screwed up this whole batch. We're like, wow, it's not drying. Like it's been three hours. It's not dry yet. And like, we just destroyed this huge batch of leaves and like, oh, this really sucks. Cause we spent like all week preparing for this. And then we're like, okay, whatever. Let's just let it run and see where it goes. Who knows? And then we kind of like leave and come back and we're like, whoa, it smells like roasted cranberries in here. Like, what is that? And then uh, a couple of the staff that were like cleaning up, they're like, dude, like it smells like desserts. Like what's yeah, going on? Yeah. We go to the machine, we like pull it out and we're like, holy shit, this smells so good. And so we, by accident, we ended up kind of slow drying this, this batch of tea that ended up tasting like unbelievable. And it was by far the best batch we ever made. And so at that point from then on, we then use that formula wow. to create all of our other uh, batches of tea like the base tea for all of our products including the dry tea wow so it was kind of an accidental innovation but it all happened because we ended up going to enrique's farm and getting out of that dude's like super shady situation uh and like yeah just like i know there's a lot of That's stories lot, built man. into that it's hard it's hard to tell the whole story but i'm trying to do it chronologically more yeah, or less yeah 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 but yeah, dude, it's super gnarly when you're trying to like navigate this and you're doing it on on a zero dollar budget. That's you what know? I'm saying. On a, yeah, it's, it's not like you're like lush with clash being just like with cash, dude. just being like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. Yeah, and like I've had my whole uh, my whole mobile office backpack got jacked on a bus. Uh, I got tricked by these two guys. They played it. They totally played me, um, like subtle play, and I end up getting screwed over. So it's like you know my phone got jacked twice after that too, and same with my co-founders. And it's just damn. like you know it's when you're always like in the cheapest possible hostel, taking the cheapest possible transportation, you know, to, to get things done, it gets a lot, it's a lot harder. And then once you like every year we leveled up, like, oh, now we have a rental car. Like, holy crap, what a luxury. Crazy. Like insane. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And then the next time we got there, like, dude, we have a rental car and we have a rented apartment. <laughs> holy shit. Like we're just like, bro, we got dollars. <laughs> exactly. And so you just like, it's those little wins too when you at least you know you're getting somewhere every year you're like okay i feel like we actually have progress here beyond just like sales numbers yeah. like actual kind of you know uh like management level type of uh of a foundation and so that helps now you know we go down there we don't feel so run and gun you know we actually have something set up and we got you know the whole farm is running and running smooth and yeah we just put in another order for three more tons of dry tea to get to get uh produced by Whoa. uh september october three tons of dry tea that's a lot yeah we did seven last year this is just a short order for the for like a quick winter one and also for a couple uh industrial clients that want to start using the dry tea in their own products so whoa yeah man. building it up it's not only like a, a consumer product but it's also like finding its way into other brands as well so crazy so yeah. hold on let me just i know for, there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> from my own from my own mind here so you're down there you create the connections and initially when you go down you're going down with nothing like you don't know anybody do you have uh, connections? we only found one, like we called every country in latin america to be like hey like or find we we called every tea producing brand okay whether it's herbal or or traditional tea or whatever um to see if they'd be interested in working with us because we need someone that had expertise to actually create tea and Got like it. put it in tea bags and put it in package all the stuff how we, does that work? we had yeah, zero right. experience and the only ones that got back to us were in Nicaragua. And it's this small organic herbal tea company that just grows all their own herbs for their local market. Mm. And I had already been in Nicaragua to go surfing um, and a couple of trips before then after like a, a, a tourism consulting gig I had. And so I was like, oh, well, I'm familiar with the country and they're, everyone there is so friendly. And 
to get around. It's really easy, like, mm-hmm. it's, and it's progressive business wise. So like, that's a perfect place. Why not? Uh, and so we went down there and had those guys lined up, but we still didn't have a farmer. Uh, yeah. So that was the big, link. Got it. that was the missing link for got sure. It. Okay. So, yeah. so you had, you kind of had one little sliver of an in, uh, that yeah, you, you yeah. kind of barely, and then figured out the farming situation. So now, now what happens? So you have the farmer, it's processed down there, it's shipped up here. How do I get this in my hand? Like, what's the whole process? Yeah. So basically we do it at a recase farm in Nicaragua. It's a 1400 meter elevation. And, um, he actually has all the machinery in house. So when we moved there, we didn't have to have a secondary partner to, to do like the drying dope. and whatnot. Right. So we have all the innovation there. We can create everything, new batches all the time. Um, and then once it gets done in like a bulk, kind of basically a base tea, like a dry tea, we ship it to Vancouver, uh, where here we do like the blends for the dry tea uh, in like tea bags or loose leaf, whatever. Um, and then we ship also the the base tea down to uh, down to Portland, where then they're actually canning it with uh, like the different extracts that we add, like grapefruit extract, for example. Right. And right, we would have right, done right. it locally, but there was no partners locally that had uh, the right equipment to uh, to kind of finish the product and make sure it was shelf stable. Uh, basically, a tunnel pasteurizer is just like a huge piece of equipment that costs a lot of money. So sure. couldn't find everyone here is beer and kombucha, and when it's fermented, like it's a different story. You don't need to have pasteurization. Mm. So we tried everywhere, and we tried to make a deal happen with lots of different partners. It didn't work, so we're like, screw it. We found a guy in Portland. Let's just go there. Wow, crazy man, that's yeah. in freaking sane. So. <sighs> All right, <laughs> so so now you have the can, you have the actual the the tea. And you said you have some like industrial partners now. Like, how does this shit work? Like, I just want to know. Like, so great. You have the you have the leaf tea. Now you're like, okay, iced tea is a huge huge opportunity. Is like as a consumer good, incredible. We need to figure out these four things. Like you said, pasteurization. I think like milk. Yeah. I'm like, what? It's basically just it's like doing a, not quite a boil, but you bring it to 75 degrees for about 12 to 15 minutes. Okay. And that just makes sure that if there's any biologic or any um any microbiological uh you know organisms in there for yeah. example if there's a tiny bit of yeast that lands in it you know in Somehow. the in the air when it's canning whatever it'll actually mold or ferment and because because it's not pasteurized and because or rather before you pasteurize it because it's just like a straight tea and it's not fermented it can ferment in the can uh, so if we didn't pasteurize it'd have to be in a fridge the whole way through the consumer which jacks uh, up the price for everybody including the end user because it would be like you know maybe four bucks instead of 249 because the cost of refrigeration so that's it. why kombuchas are like four or five dollars or, or more because oh. refrigeration aspect for a kombucha that's actually has a live culture um beer is a little bit different but I, yeah it's a different story but for us it was like we want to make this shelf stable we want to make sure that you know when it comes off the line it can sit on a on a shelf or pantry for a year no problem and then you ice it whenever you like got it okay. and that got way it's just simple clean and it's very consistent we don't have any loss of product or whatever got it that totally makes sense but still just take the process of the whole thing like that's one of the things i find most striking is like okay you go down there with no context no con no contacts no context and you're like all right we'll figure it out you create this and you're like all right we'll figure it out what's the steps of like even now, like what it seems at the stage you're at right now, I know e-commerce is popping and the tea is popping. You're going out, you're getting in more stores, kind of again, more locally. I know you mm-hmm. did the whole U.S. expansion and now you're kind of back a little bit. Now, like what's the process of for all the entrepreneurs that are listening, going out and like getting shelf space? How does that work? Yeah, it's like when we did the dry tea, it was it's a it's a seasonal product and it's also a slower turning category so buyers were really reticent to take on the product because it's a big commitment Ah. uh because they only change it once a year in most cases got it and for ready to drink like you know because consumers can just try new ready to drink at any moment and it costs anywhere between two to four dollars or less um you know they're they're really they're way more apt to try because if it works it works great and if it doesn't it's fine. They it's didn't, two bucks. They, yeah, they didn't lose a lot of money or like they didn't lose a lot of commitment uh, because it's a very, it's kind of a shifting category all the time. There's always something new coming out. Um, so in terms of just going out there and get a shelf space, like it's really, it's not glamorous. It's the same old, it's like selling out of the trunk of a car. Like shit. I mean, I was, I was telling you, I was in Tofino camping right. and the car is full of product and I'm hitting up stores the whole time. That's crazy, Like I'm camping man. and working and surfing and like people are like laughing at me. Like we're like, <laughs> this oh my god this is a funny moment i was just selling into this store she's like yeah i'll take like a bunch of cases like it was like okay perfect so i'll just run out to the car and i'm running out to the car and there's like my clothes is kind of like on the side over there you know and, and the side of the seat or whatever and like you can kind of see like a pair of boxers kind of tucked away in the corner and she walks out 
to the car and I was like, no, no, I was like, you see all my junk, God damn. And so she's like, oh wow, you're selling out of the car. And I was like, well, like it's a hustle. What are you supposed to do? Like, yeah. I don't have any distributors out here. Like this is how it gets built, right? And so, yeah, I mean, it's really just about persistence and just like you Fuck. know, making sure you you tell a retailer how they can make the money and and especially how the product is competitive with other things. So, like in our category, in iced tea, you have either an unsweetened iced tea where it's very bitter and mm-hmm. kind of traditional tea where it's it's not transparent on the sourcing, and it's uh you know it's kind of a tr- more of a traditional brand, let's say. Um, and then you know on the flip side, you have like the sweetened iced teas that are like thirty grams of sugar, crazy, and they're just basically syrup. And so, and even the ones that say like, oh, lightly sweet, it's like twenty five grams. You're just it's, like, this is crazy. Like, remember like that uh, herba nuts. mate? What is that? Uh, uh, yerba mate stuff. Yeah, even like that. Like I look at that, I'll grab it off the shelf. Like, oh yeah, cool. Uh, low sugar alternative. Flip it to the back. Nope, twenty six grams. I'm like, <laughs> how? Yeah. So like for us, it was like, oh, that's that's kind of like. It's a challenge in that space, and and I think the the main reason why there's so much sugar in a lot of those teas, in most teas, is that they're just they they taste bitter on their own, mm-hmm. and to make them shelf stable, they usually add like a citric acid or vitamin C just so so it lowers the pH. In our case, we add like a tiny bit of lemon juice, and it lowers the pH, and it also just complements the taste of the tea. Right, and because the coffee leaf, like I say, the main from a taste perspective, the main um, uh, value proposition is that the coffee leaf is not tannic like it doesn't have astringency or or like bitter mm. aspect right and so you can drink it straight up and steep it for like an hour if you like if with the dry tea and like it never gets bitter at all and that's right. why most pe- people that as soon as they learn about the product and start drinking it they realize it's just so smooth and it has a light amount of caffeine it's like i can drink this all day like really casually has a super clean aftertaste what's, so, what's yeah. the amount of caffeine like in a can or just like in a cup of tea versus yeah so a cup of tea like a regular let's say eight ounce 250 mil cup sure. of tea for us with like two grams of, of tea would be about 20 milligrams uh, okay. and the green tea is be about 30 35 and this is actually 35 grams we yeah. up the concentration a little bit so you can get more of that kind of that that flavor through uh so yeah this is like basically about a quarter of a coffee hmm. but it's also like even if i were to chug four of these I wouldn't have the same effect as like a jittery coffee. Like you don't you don't get that like gut rot aspect. It's not that acidic compared to a coffee. Like mm-hmm. coffee's way gnarlier on your nervous system and, and also just your digestive tract. Um and so yeah, it's more subtle and like the best way I've found so far is like I'm drinking one of these in the morning, probably like seven, eight AM or after my workout, maybe ten or eleven, and then I have another one around three or four o'clock. Uh-huh. And like it's just you get the you get the right amount of energy right when you need it. And as soon as it just weans off, like you could just ride it out for the rest of the day. Whereas coffee, it's like you get a jolt in the beginning, roller coaster, and then it, and then yeah, you're basically riding a roller coaster. And then as soon as it's uh, as soon as that you know effectiveness of like the boost of caffeine is gone, you crash hard. But even if you're crashed, that caffeine's still in your blood system. Got it. You know, for a long time. And the one thing that like I, the one thing for anyone to take away from this in terms of health and caffeine necessarily is, caffeine is a half life of six hours. If you take uh, a small coffee, which has like 120 milligrams at, let's say, noon, sure. at 6 p.m., you're going to have 60 milligrams, which is like having a fresh black tea, for example. At midnight, you're still going to have 30 grams, which is like having one of these at midnight uh. when you're literally sleeping. But that caffeine is not giving you an effect. It's just it's just keeping you up. It's not actually giving you energy in that sense right? because it's blocking the adenosine receptors in your brain. Mm. It's just mimicking what uh, you know a regular adenosine would do for you. Um, but at the end of the day, it just it's block. It's like just blocking out like your tiredness, which is what you need to fall asleep. Got it. And so that's the one thing with coffee. I was like, you know, sometimes I like relapse, let's say, and I just like, oh, you know, I actually really miss coffee. I'm just gonna have a cup of coffee, whatever, and like taste it. By the time I get halfway through, I'm just like, my gut is like upside down, and I'm just like, oh my god, why did I do this? Like, I mm. this is exactly why I'm doing this alternative beverage because it's just so aggressive. Yeah, it's and, very aggressive. You know, there's a lot of other alternatives for sure. Like, you know, maybe the coffee leaf isn't exactly what you're looking for, but I still would, you know, I implore you to at least give it a shot because you'll see how smooth it is and how easy it is in the body. And it just, it just tastes really fucking good. Yeah, it tastes super good. And it's only like a gram of sugar, which is absolutely Yeah, like the insane. one gram of sugar because it's not bitter. Yeah. And people ask like, oh, why one gram? You should have just gone zero. Mm. And it's like, well, because we... Like the the coffee leaf itself tastes so smooth because we add a tiny bit of lemon juice. It added it added a tiny bit of tartness that uh, to the product, and so we're like, you know what? Let's just do it to one gram because that just balances it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, if we go in and we tried this, we go into people say, hey, we have zero gram sugar in this product. They assume there's stevia. 
They assume mm. it's a diet product and they assume that it has this weird chemical taste. So if we say only one gram of cane sugar, no stevia, they're just like, oh, wow, that's actually kind of cool, right? So, so yeah. you got water, real brewed coffee, leaves, cane sugar, lemon juice, and mango flavor. That's it. Yeah. That one has an Alfonso mango flavor. This one is a grapefruit extract. And then the original, which is the straight somewhere, the, the green can, yeah. it's just the straight base. Yeah. Yeah. So that's super sick. So like, what is it about coffee, man? Like this, let's dive in. <laughs> let's go. Um, it's, I've been an avid, same as you, man, finance industry, coffee when I wake up for the, for the, I mean, used to like even a year ago, cause six months ago, um, coffee when I wake up, like I'll be up four or five, six, be getting a workout in do my espresso right away, bam, I'm going. When I get to work, you know, six, seven, getting a coffee there, climbing throughout the day, two, three, four, bam, 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 everyone wants a coffee right off the bat, right? And so it's just like, it just seems integrated into the fabric of, you know, my work and life. Obviously there's a little bit of a change now, but what is it about coffee that is, we always, I have this idea in my mind or I previously had this idea in my mind that it's it's harmless. It's not a drug. It's not. It's 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 harmless. It's like tea, and that's very not the case. What what is the case with coffee? What's the common misconception? I think people love to be abused by things. <laughs> <laughs> sure, 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 sure. And, sure. and I'll, I'll provide a little bit of color for that. So right. think of it this way, like you know. And, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to take away from other people's situations. And these are really serious stories, but like, you know, it's like, um, what was, what's that? Oh my God, I'm going to struggle pulling this up. No worries. It's that, um, that like, um, like the captor complex or captor syndrome. No idea. Do you guys know what we're talking about? It's like when you're, when you're like a, a prisoner of war, you end up, you end up like needing the person that's torturing you in a Whoa. sense. Oh, I don't know. Ugh, that's crazy. We'll look it up. Well, yeah, some, I don't know. Crazy. I'm going to look it up right now because yeah. I want it. I want this on, on like, you know, yeah, on the record. I don't want to look like a fucking There you go. Yeah, you're cool. You're cool. You're cool. Um, you're cool. So it's, it's the idea of you need the thing that is torturing you and you need to be tortured in a certain way. It's like, uh, Sounds like oh, some... Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, Stockholm Never syndrome. heard of it in my life. Oh yeah. Okay. So what are you talking about? So Stockholm syndrome. It's like, and the the way I see this relating to coffee is that like, you know, you're so used to being in this vicious cycle that you you end up like relishing in it, mm. and it, that's why people say like they glorify how much coffee they drink, and it's like, oh man, I need that coffee, or else I can't talk to you in the morning, or like it's like, wow. So you're basically saying that you're an asshole unless you drink coffee. You're an addict. Like. Yeah. Come on, yeah. like if you really are admitting to that, then you have really no self-control like in, in that yeah. sense. And I know that that sounds hyperbolic, but at the end of the day, you know, if you were to actually wean off the coffee, maybe you just have a morning one and then the afternoon one find alternatives, mm -hmm. whether it's this, whether it's something else doesn't matter. Um, but I feel like people got stuck in this mindset where especially in like in like the crazy work hustle world that we're in now that you have to work like you know, unlimited amount of hours in North America, especially like Europe is a bit different. Uh, people get stuck in this mentality where you need some sort of additive or some sort of boost to get you to that level or to force you to keep working that, you know, beyond just fuel, like coffee is not fuel. It's, it's not, it's, it's lying to your know. brain that you're not tired. Yeah. And that's a, a big difference. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're buying like future energy by doing that by actually blocking your ability to sleep. And so you're like taking this like fake energy for now. And then, you know, the next day you're going to be exhausted because you didn't sleep well. So you're, the cycle continues. It's like you're built. Yeah. You're building this like terrible sleep debt basically just by tricking your brain into thinking that you're not tired, but your, your natural cycle is like, no, like my body needs to rest. I need to recoup recover. And so, you know, I did this whole thing, you know, where I was super highly caffeinated all the time from coffee and it basically just, it just destroyed me. And I was training all the time. I was working all the time, had side clients, et cetera. And at the end of the day, like my sleeps were terrible. And I went into, I went into training camp, like just so exhausted mm -hmm. and injured, you know, cause like I was just, wasn't recovering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, over time I realized like, this is just not the way to go. And so I feel like now with this like kind of wider awakening, you know, obviously internet has helped. There's been a lot of, <clears throat> a lot more people getting into health and wellness. COVID has helped in some sense where people are re they're, they're re, um, calibrating, their routines and try new things because you kind of have to, in a sense, mm. it's like this giant, you know, reassessment of your life, you know, mm. whether it's daily or whether it's over a years, et cetera. And, and I feel like, um, 
you know, <clears throat> most people are realizing they don't need as much caffeine as they're consuming because it actually takes away from your the human experience. It takes away from your energy levels. Mm. And uh, it's just, it's a, it's detrimental. Like you, you think you're helping yourself, but it's not. It, it really isn't. Caffeine takes away from your human experience. Yeah. What do you mean? Because I, because why are, like why are you forcing yourself to go through a roller coaster when you can just float on a on a cloud? Yeah. Like why why are you going for these ups and downs and you're like glorifying these ups and downs and crashes and then when you have a crash you're like oh I need another one. It's like you realize you're just piling up all this caffeine in your blood system that will will not allow you to sleep properly later on and like ruin your REM cycles etc. You won't recover. So it's like you're literally making your your tomorrow way worse by doing this and that just it just compiles and like sleep debt just piles and piles it's and crazy. piles and like you know you talk to anyone who works in silicon valley or even downtown some of the tech firms or whatever and they're just like sleeping in their cubicles and drinking coffee and working and it's like you're taking years off your life doing this yeah and instead of trying to like crush through all this stuff highly caffeinated you'll do kind of more in some cases you'll do more scattered work and you won't be as kind of clean and concise and productive if you just had like a nice clean like neutral energy level and we're just like awake but not like overclocked you mm -hmm, know because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. caffeine will like overclock the system it drains your adrenals what, what is the deal with the adrenal gland the fire <laughs> the what is the deal give me the brass tacks what's going on here people always just throw that word out i'm like i don't know what you're talking about it's basically the coffee um the high amount of caffeine but also the compounds in coffee will spike your cortisol level okay. and, and cortisol is basically a stress hormone and so it puts you automatically into a fight or flight mode so even if you're sitting there like reading a book, you're going to be in fight or flight mode and your body is like buzzing and you think you're like, oh, I feel great. I feel energetic and I feel like productive. It's like actually your body is in putting is, is, being, is being put in red alert. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, when you get to those those moments, let's say you're working a long week and you have a deadline project. When you get to those moments, there's nothing left in the tank. Yeah. And I've been there before. Like we've done conferences like Expo West in, in in LA that is like such an excruciating week that by like the second or third day, you're already kind of like running thin. And if you try to have a coffee, like it literally just puts me to bed. Like what? I can't even, I can't even, Crazy. I have nothing left. I'm drained. Crazy. And so that's what happened when I overdosed in, in, in France because I was just working too much and drinking way too much coffee. It's hectic. And, and your body has no ability to like pull out that extra 10%, that extra RPM when it really needs it because you already have just been scraping. It's already gone. You've been scraping the bottom of the barrel. It's already gone. Yeah, yeah it's so yeah. crazy, man. So yeah, the natural natural work cycles, natural sleep cycles, like our natural rhythm, like I think it's every 90 minutes or whatever it is, like taking productive rest yeah. is as important as productive work. Um, and we have zero productive rest if we're jacked up all the time, right? Yeah. So, okay, cool. There's an issue, potential solution, or just like, uh, what's the way to integrate off of that? Because like, this isn't like, I say there's a thousand people listening right now, 99 fucking percent of them are like hyped up on coffee because that's <laughs> the crowd we fucking attract. You know, like what's the, what's the process of like actually getting off of that and recovering and like getting your stress response system like back to baseline because I've yeah. noticed for myself, like I switch, like I, I do decaf coffee. Um, like I, like I, I'm a, I just love fucking coffee, like everything about it. Like whether it's the, the conversations that come, whether it's the, the morning routine, whether it's the smell, the taste, yeah, like I love it. But like the caffeine, I just can't do it anymore. Cause I'm just like, you know, yeah. um, but like, what's the process of like actually making change of like getting off this shit and not becoming dependent because I'll like, you know, months ago, years ago, even I'd go like cold turkey. I'd just be like, this is fucked. I'm done. No, yeah. See, that, <laughs> and it that is doesn't work. Horrible. That doesn't work. You, you shouldn't do that. No. So what's the process? It's kind of like smoking in a sense. Like for some, I mean, smoking is a bit different where people can go cold turkey and it works. But I find that with caffeine, it's not a situation where you need to just cut everything out. Mm. Um, obviously, there's just, is a, there is a transition and you don't want to go through like really shitty withdrawal symptoms. Right. And so the way that we try to like, you know, educate or, or recommend people is if you're drinking like four coffees a day, let's say, sure. cut out like the last two and replace it with something like this or with just water and a bit of electrolytes, for mm. example. Um, you know, especially the afternoon ones, because those those are the ones that will really Keep affect you your sleep. Up, yeah. yeah, they'll really affect your sleep down the road. And um, if you're crashing, like you'd be surprised how much just like 
you know, a liter of water can do. Yeah. And like, there's just so many times where people are like, oh, I'm so tired. I need coffee. It's like, no, you literally You're just dehydrated. Need, you need water and minerals. Yeah. Or you need something that has just more kind of, you know, energy to it, but but not a caffeine perspective, like something a bit different. So it's it's something where, you know, you need to cut out the subsequent cups. Feel free to have morning cup, whatever. If that gets you out of bed, that's fine. But I've been finding personally, uh, I make my own electrolyte powder mix. Mm. It's from like four or five ingredients you can get on Amazon. It's basically just basic minerals okay, like that sure. you'd find in like noon tablets or whatever, like same thing, but just dirt cheap because you just mix it at home got it um and i basically just put a teaspoon of that in like a glass of water and i drink that before my workout this is the first thing i drink in the morning ah. and that gives me more energy than anything else because it just hydrates the brain and the muscles and then i can do the, the workout no problem after the workout i'll have one of these go into my meetings and just feel like really refreshed and have like kind of a nice light a boost yeah it's not bad at all right and then afternoon i'll have another one of these uh you know i i've been on the grapefruit a lot recently um yeah and then in the evening before i go to bed or like or like kind of you know after dinner i'll have some more of the electrolyte powder um especially because i'm doing keto basically monday to friday and you need a lot of electrolytes to just maintain your hydration uh so that's kind of forced me to really learn more about it but i would say like cut out the subsequent cups anything after noon especially like or even after 11 a.m you can cut those out and just drink something that's lower caffeine our dry tea has 20 milligrams per cup so that's really really manageable yeah these have 35 so if you're looking for something kind of a bit stronger but it won't like you know what's it what's a cup of coffee again a cup of coffee is about 120 for a small cup <laughs> small cup if you get like a like a medium or a larger uh starbucks you're yeah. looking at 200 okay yeah which is crazy <laughs> and even you know what's you know what's unfortunate is that the government um, uh, standards for like what is a reasonable amount of caffeine or like your upper limit of caffeine for mm. them was 400 milligrams a day. Mm. And for kids, it's like 200 something. And it's like, dude, are you kidding me, bro? Like same thing with sugar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the same, same, thing, it's with the same thing as sugar. And so like it's kind of the same idea. It's like this tastes delicious, kind of lightly sweet, you know, almost unsweet. Not quite. It's kind of in between. And it's one gram. That's crazy. You know, like you don't need 40 grams of sugar to, for something that tastes good. Like, let's get real. If you need 40 grams of sugar for your tea to taste good, your tea must be junk. Well, here's the thing is like our, our taste buds are shot. Like our yeah, palates. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fucked. Yeah. Especially um, in North America. We love like crazy bold flavor. You know, you go to you go to Japan, you go to Europe, way more refined. Yeah. Subtle, subtle flavors. Exactly. And like, yeah. Even if you go and you just go off the grid or you go to any one of these tropical countries and you just eat natural fruits or veggies or whatever, like. People don't realize that a carrot is sweet. <laughs> yeah, dude, exactly. A carrot like, has a lot of carbs too. A carrot is very sweet. <laughs> it's a sweet vegetable. And you'd be like, oh, carrots. Like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, Are you yeah. joking? Dude. Um, so like that's incredible. That's crazy. So the palate's the palate's kind of fucked. But then on top of that, the the cultural like narrative around the whole thing is just completely AWOL. So that's like one of the things that I'm very deeply curious about right now, whether it's talking to guys like you or holistic nutritionists or whoever, fucking psychology majors or philosophy majors. It's like, dude, how do you change the narrative of coffee and sugar? Like primarily, like primarily those two, because I see those as the main drivers of like anxiety, poor health, dude, yeah. death. Like literally every problem that we have as humans is stemmed. Like I'm a huge believer in the gut. Like, I'm just a huge believer in what you put in your body. And I think that we can solve a huge amount of like, get okay, listen, between cutting out like actual drugs, uh, coffee included, and cutting out the amount of sugar and shitty foods and refined foods we're having and meditation, I honestly think we could change the world. It's like 80% of the world's problems are coming from those, gone. a few of those things. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. how do we change that narrative, man? Because I mean, that's what's going to change the world and fucking make this this company just go to the moon. I mean, aside from our our, our business in, in that case, just generally speaking, I think to, to answer the question is, I think people need to be, they, they need to not be afraid of changing a routine because it's really easy to just do the same thing again the next day. Yeah. It's really, really easy. Yeah. And and like, for example, like, you know, I w I've been vegetarian for six years. I went vegan two years ago. Whoa. And like, and now doing vegan keto, okay? <laughs> You got to basically Damn, cook everything bro. you eat. Yeah, it's but Whoa. but I'm but I've I've done it for my own learning experience, my own experiment. Sure. And like you know, that being said, like I went strict uh, uh, keto like a year ago for for like or rather two years ago for like pretty much the whole summer just to like really learn how it works and learn how my body changed. 
and and it, it's been great but now i do it basically monday to friday mm. and so it goes back to the same thing as, as caffeine it's like if you want you can go full cold turkey you're gonna suffer for sure <laughs> there's gonna so, be some suffering so you involved. don't have to but yeah. you don't have to like you can always just manage it instead of having a pack a day of cigarettes save the one cigarette for that one hour of the day like five o'clock after work and then you're gonna savor that thing every single day yeah. and you're already doing yourself a favor but you haven't fully cut out that vice that you just need Got you it. know what i mean Got it. you don't it's not either a pack a day or zero it's like you can always find a middle ground where you have you use it strategically you know and so you know when i when i did keto it's like i had to learn so much stuff especially vegan keto because it's <laughs> Keto, the one I thing I, know the one thing I can't, man. I know the one thing I can't stand about crazy. keto. The one thing I can't stand about keto is like everyone's like, oh, now I gotta eat bacon and eggs every day. I'm like, no. yeah, it's like okay, well, you're you're, you're gonna die early because of that, bro. <laughs> like, I hate, I hate to say it, but it's like clinically proven. Um, and so it's like there are so many other ways to do that, and it forces you to learn how to cook new things. Right. It forces you to look at your nutritional intake every day. I've never known more about my food and my food systems and and my digestion and everything else myself without doing these challenges for my just for me and it wasn't like a social media influencer that told me to do this i didn't go i didn't sign up for some newsletter to like blah 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 this and that it's like just don't be afraid to try it force yourself to learn something new it keeps things fresh every day it keeps your mind active and it also makes you in tune with who you are and like whether you end up realizing you know what this is way too much screw it i'll go back to my old thing and it still works mm. but i i know what that is like now and i know where i can improve and there might be some kind of midway point where that works so just i just uh, i really stress to people like don't be afraid to just break up your routine and just try something new like it's not that hard in the end it you build up this huge monumental task you know where you think it's like this giant mountain to climb but in the end it's like no dude it's sure like not. literally one decision versus the other and in the end it's like who do you want to be it's like oh i'm going to be that part. i'm going to be that person today yeah. let's try and be that person every day this week and yeah. see where it goes okay let's line it up let's do it next two weeks yeah and then you realize wait a sec this is actually really easy and i'm feeling better and when you feel better it motivates you to keep doing it new baseline you it's just baseline. The, it's just the momentum you yeah. know for sure that's dope so i gotta ask man what do you eat <laughs> dude uh a vegan keto this is yeah, wild bro. you're here for here folks first here <laughs> what the fuck uh How? okay so it's actually not that complicated it um, sounds pretty complicated uh obviously like there's a lot of things i don't eat for sure okay. uh, that's just you know goes without saying um uh, but pretty much yeah get up in the morning electrolyte water have one of these after my workout have a, a about a 700 calorie smoothie at lunch that has, what's in the smoothie man come on break it down uh chocolate protein powder okay. like vega with MCT oil, okay. uh, Left Coast Performance, I think local brand. Okay. Um, and then uh, peanut butter, chia, three tablespoons of chia because the fiber is what ends up making your whole body work way better yeah. and absorbs the energy and everything else and also for your brain health. Um, more electrolytes in there. And then also cinnamon and uh, a little bit of extra uh, five grams of uh, glutamine because it's good for your skin. And so I do that at lunch and it tastes amazing. It's like a chocolate peanut butter smoothie. It's absolutely delicious. I need a recipe, man. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I need a I'll, recipe. I'll send it to you. It's easy. <laughs> That's what's up. It sounds complicated. It's actually really easy. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, like basically because that I'll fit by the time I finish my smoothie, it's almost two o'clock. Yeah. And, and because keto and intermittent fasting, like I'm not really hungry. Like I'm not dying for snacks. As soon as I get off and I have like some carbs one day, yeah. I'm just like fiending for chips or something. I'm just like, and I hate that feeling. And yeah. I and I found with keto and especially IF, I don't have that like that like crack addict, like uh -huh. I need carbs. Uh -huh. You know, it's kind of like the coffee addiction in uh -huh. a sense. And and so, anyways, I I I, I get to six o'clock, no problem. And then it's like grilled, you know, like marinated tofu, uh, or like a grilled like uh, you know, vegan chicken breast, or like or like oh. not like Beyond Burgers, but the other alternative burgers with like a salad, or sometimes I'll do a pasta that's a soybean uh pasta. Right. And there's like there's some new brands out there that they taste awesome. Like it doesn't have this weird taste at all. And so I just have a pasta with that in the end, like it's just loaded with protein and fat. Um Damn, and but it's, the carbs, bro. Like veggies are full of carbs. Some of them are, yeah. Yeah. Some of them are. That's Especially so like, tough. you know, potato potatoes obviously root vegetables yeah, yeah but but like the things i live off of is like spinach avocado cucumber tomato uh cabbage red cabbage in yeah. lots of different ways yeah. um you know oh and seeds like uh, seeds and nuts are your savior nuts have still some carbs but seeds like i i do this wicked mix that i toss onto like every salad or like in other things oh um uh, pumpkin seed, sunflower seed, Ooh. and and sliced almond. How did you get on your level, man? This is yeah, crazy. Dude. What um, but the it's, heck? I know, like people will think I'm crazy, and like they're gonna think like, wow, this guy's like, you know, 
trying to prove a point or something. And it's like, I, I don't, I'm not here to prove a point. It's just literally for my own health. Yeah. And my whole life I grew up, you know, being told when you're playing hockey, eat a giant pasta meal, chicken parm four hours before hockey. Dude, I was doing that throughout university. And as soon as I realized, like I started cutting things out when I was in uni and I was like learning how my body works. I realized that like, I was just had this giant lump of food in my stomach. Yeah. Even four hours later. And then I have a carb crash by the time I get to hockey. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like we've been told the wrong shit our whole lives. Yeah, it's like crazy. our whole lives. It's crazy. You know? It's crazy. And even now, like a bunch of NHL guys, they don't have any solid food before hockey. They have a smoothie at like three or four. Yeah. And then it. they go play. And yeah. I've been and I've been doing things like that as well. Like sometimes I'll play like a you know, seven o'clock game and I'll have my my lunch smoothie later just so that when I play, I'm like light on my stomach. I got fresh fuel and there's no, you know, I'm not trying to digest as I'm playing. Yeah. And that yeah. like reassessing all of that like yeah. my daily 24 7 cycle has yeah. helped my sleep it's helped my skin i have i sometimes have psoriasis breakouts it sucks and like you know i don't need as much caffeine i have way cleaner like energy and focus mm. and i'm not starving for junk food bro like that's yeah. just the biggest yeah. thing man yeah. the biggest thing crack addicts man it's wild it's it, crazy stuff it's like coffee too like as soon as you have a little bit you're like oh your body's like dying for it again to to just feel better but yeah. it's all it's all fake you know like yeah it's 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 fake the, crashes and the, yeah the caffeine blocks your adenosine receptors and then with carbohydrates your liver thinks you're taking calories in but it literally just gets stored into your fat cells yeah and so that's why you're hungry an hour later so, like there's no there's no actual nutrition in them so wild so that's crazy yeah they don't make you and it doesn't make you sa uh, satiated no it doesn't satiate you at all yeah right that's yeah. why things like like for me blueberries watermelon love those type of things where i'm just like ah <laughs> Too many so carbs, good. dude. I'm like, that's another thing. <laughs> I barely eat fruit now. Like I'll have fruit selectively, but no. but by getting off of a lot of the carbohydrates, you realize like like you said, like how sweet natural foods are. And when I have watermelon or blueberries or it's raspberries, I'm like, dude, this like dessert. It's a lot. Oh, I love it though. <laughs> like lot. it makes you really appreciate it. And it just tastes like so much better because you blueberries oh my god because your palate's not like bombarded by you know by like chocolate or whatever things like that that are like just highly sweetened in, yeah. in most cases yeah for sure man super crazy yeah so the big question is like how do you get people over the hump whether it's coffee sugar carbs whatever it is that we're putting into our body it's like how do you get people over the bump uh, over the hump because it's like people don't realize like you're not making I don't, I, i'm speaking for you but you're not making sacrifices like your your life is better because of this shit, not worse. Am I wrong? Yeah, dude. So like one of the things we like to think is like, you know, if you're going to switch to an alternative for a better health, there's really there's no compromise there. Like I still eat amazing food right. all the time, right. you know, and yeah, it might be a little bit more limited, whatever. But I get creative with how now I'm creative with like the sauces, the marinades, and I've learned so much more how to cook because back in the day when I'd be like, okay, chicken pasta, I spent all the time on the chicken pasta, whatever, quick sauce and like maybe some steamed veggies and that's it. Easy days. But now it's like I spend a lot of time on building like a more diverse meal that has like it, there's more intricate foods that go into it and it, it's fun from a cooking perspective. I like a challenge. Um, but yeah, like. I think it's one of those things where you have to just kick yourself to just start it, mm. you know? And like the same thing happened to me on a different level. Like I came back from camping to Fino, surfing every day. I got out of my daily workout rhythm, even though I was still exercising. And I came back and I kind of got bad news that I wasn't getting this place to rent. And I was like, just kind of bummed. I was like, fuck, like this yeah. sucks. And I'm just like kind of sleeping in, just been kind of lazy all week. And like, you know, this morning I was like, okay, like fuck this. I had a slump week. I need yeah. to get out of this. So I went out and cranked out a cardio, ripped around Stanley Park on the bike and did a quick, you know, upper body thing and whatever. And it's like, okay, now I feel like myself again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's like, people always say like, I'll never have enough time or I'll never have enough whatever. And it's like, if you just realize how much time you waste on other things and you realize how much more energy you'll have if you do the right things to prepare yourself for that, yeah. it's actually way easier than you think. And again, it's just forcing yourself to start it um, I don't know what the, you know, that's the magic bullet that everyone's looking for. That's what like all of like the late night TV, the TV ads are selling. You know what I mean? Like this magic pill or whatever. Right. Yeah. But honestly, I, I just think it's willpower. Um, it's, it's really hard to, to place another way, but you know, small things like listening to the right podcast, listening to the right, uh, audio books, like right. what every, every summer I listen in the springtime, I listen to, uh, can't hurt me by David Goggins oh. because that is straight fire, oh. dude. Like that guy. <laughs> Oh Crazy my God. Shit. 
it's it's not anything that I recommend for anyone to do what he did, but the fact that he threw himself into so many things completely unprepared and still persevered makes you realize that you're so comfy yeah. and you could so easily do a lot of these things that he's done because you can do more research or you can prepare or, or don't not just go as hard, right? Dude. But you can do all those things like way easier than you think. And so it's just about kind of, you know, kicking yourself in the butt sometimes and and setting some goals, you know, like yeah. small goals that aren't crazy. Yeah. Just like every day I'm going to do this for half an hour and like, and then where I'm at, where am I at in a week or two? And is it helping me? Do I like it? Eventually your body will crave that, you know, that's the crazy part too. Yeah. When it's, you feel it, your body like wants it again It yeah. wants it more. Dude, for years, for, it was meditation for me. It was, yeah. for years, I hated, I hate, I hated that shit, dude. It's, it was just like, at first, it's so brutal. hard. Yeah. You're like, oh my God. Like, yeah, I yeah, for yeah. five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And like, and now the cravings are here. I'm like, I gotta have it. I gotta exactly, have it. Exactly. Like, yeah. I, need, I need 20 minutes. I need 10 minutes. And it's just like, dude. And I, on this podcast, I to, will fucking tell you, like, you go back, like, I don't know, 50, 60 episodes. I'll be like, dude, I still hate this shit. And I've been, <laughs> and I've been doing it for like, yeah. for like, Two, three years, I still hate this shit. And it's like only recently has it like kicked in and just been like, nah, this is a necessity now. Right. And it's like the same thing where it's just like now when I go back and um like I you you crave you will crave healthy habits as much as you crave unhealthy habits if you <laughs> wire it the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So key. It's it's like building um building the habit so that every time you accomplish it you have like optimism and you'll feel that throughout the day. And then the body just wants to always be in that state of mind. Absolutely. And like it's simple, the, simple math, the weeks where I get in like four workouts or whatever on the weekend on my rest days, I like still want to work out, but I'm telling myself I, I should just relax, just do some stretching or whatever totally. and just maybe warm up a little bit, but not just get too into it because you know, you end up taking away. So yeah, man. Uh, you still need to recover. And, and, but at that point it's like, I know I've earned it. I've yeah. earned the rest. Absolutely. And then, and then you just feel like, you know, you go into Monday just feeling like ready to ready go, to go. Can take on anything. Whereas like last week, it didn't work out at all. And I just like every day I was just kind of like, oh, my God, Fuck like it. just kind of dreading these like small challenges. Whereas as soon as you kick that habit again or get back into gear, all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, this is just just easy peasy bread and butter. No, no worries. <sighs> yeah, so. man, totally. It's everything. Brute, this, this is dope. This is amazing. Thank you for coming on. Um, <laughs> dude, where where can we where can we find everything? Where what's the plug? Where uh, yeah, on, right. online? What we got? Like where you got everyone hyped up for the past hour and a half? What's where where can we get it? Yeah, sure. So if you're in Vancouver, uh, hit up Choices. Choices, uh, sweet. Famous Foods is just did an end cap with us. They've been flying through products, so good for them. I love that store. Dope. Um, sun like places like Sunrise Grocery in Chinatown, for example. Uh, but our, we have a store lo uh, locator on the website. Sweet. Uh, so I just checked that out. It's Drink Wise, Drink Wise with a Z. Yeah. Uh, dot com. And uh, beyond that, we're also on Amazon in the U.S. Uh, but yeah, check out the website. That's probably the easiest place to go. And Dope, we have man. really quick shipping. It fulfills within two or three days. So, Dope, man. I love it. Dude, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, Thanks bud. for coming yeah, on, bro. Enjoy. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Guys, thank you for checking out another episode. I really, really appreciate it. I know I'm talking hella fast right now, but... I'm not even on coffee, man. Zero coffee. This is a caffeine-free episode. Wild. Although I did just have a couple milligrams in that uh, wise. Anyways, guys, try to take some incremental steps. If you're a heavy coffee drinker, you love the coffee culture or whatever it is, you love the sugar culture, try to take some incremental steps back um, and, and try to like regain your energy and, and rebalance your hormonal and your stress uh, symptoms and systems. Uh, you can do that through, you know, supplementing with, a product like this kind of dope uh anyways you can go and and, and check out drinkwise.ca.com uh, and and figure out the online shipping or whatever it may be or where the the closest spot to you is and 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 get some and try to take steps in the right direction and it, it'll add value to your life i swear um other than that, guys, thank you guys so, so much for listening. If you guys have a chance, go write a review, give us five stars. It helps other people uh, share the podcast. If this information is useful, um, share it with somebody. Don't just don't be selfish with your information. Give it to someone else too. Um, hey, listen, I got a homie who drinks too much coffee. <coughs> Kevin Wong, <coughs> Raiden, <coughs> Rhea, all you guys, uh, let me throw this to you. Check out this podcast. Here's some valuable information. It might help you. Uh, that's how our podcast grows. That's how people think you're epic and think you're more educated and intelligent. And uh, it's all around a good thing. Anyways, guys, thank you for checking us out. And I will see you guys next week. See ya.